start, just keep us on time. So if people could start making their way back to the seats, that'd be greatly appreciated. I hope you've had a lovely break and enjoyed meeting new people and of course sampling the food and milk. Uh, so what you'll come back to on your seats, Hemel Garden Communities are holding a uh, survey, a uh, feedback survey. And so if you do get an opportunity, if you could uh, complete that, and they're just a stall right in the back corner, um, and they'd really appreciate participants. Um, so that's that's what those are. Oh, and you can win a free electric bike. <laughs> can everyone hear me okay? There we go. Okay. There was a bit more hush then. That worked. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Well, with that in mind, um, I'm now going to pass you over to Claire from the Greater Southeast Net Zero Hub uh, so we can find out a bit more about retrofits and home energy efficiency. Thank you very much. Um, you probably won't have heard of the Net Zero Hub. hub. Don't worry. Uh, not many people have. We were set back up back in 2018. Uh, and mainly we work with local authorities, so I work directly with people like Mel uh, to support various different projects. I'll tell you a bit more about the one I work on in particular in just a second. We also do work with uh, larger community groups as well. I'm going to really whip through this because I've been given 10 minutes and I do want to stick to time. So the area that I work on is uh, on the domestic retrofit side of things. I came on board with the hub last August and started working on their Lab 2 programme. Uh, that finished at the end of September and we're now working on sustainable warmth. Both of the projects are kind of much of a muchness. We work with people living in fuel poverty, uh, so people with, on low incomes uh, in energy inefficient properties, um, and we provide fully funded uh, measures, so things like PV, um, or solar photovoltaic panels, um, insulation, new heating systems, etc. So that's what I'm really uh, here to talk about. Uh, retrofit and home energy efficiency. I wanted to show you this slide as a starting point, just to give you an indication of why it's important to start thinking about your home energy efficiency. Um, because as you can see, uh, heating, which will be made, made up of space heat, heating primarily, but also water heating, um, forms the largest part of your personal carbon footprint. So it is well worth considering your home if you're looking to reduce your personal carbon footprint. But where to start? So I'm going to guide you through what I would recommend if you're thinking about improving your home. So the first port of call is to really understand your home. You're all going to have really unique homes and circumstances, so it's not really possible to give one size fits all recommendations. But if you do have one, your energy performance certificate or EPC is a really good place to start. So what you can see on the screen here is the energy performance certificate for my home. This was calculated about seven years ago, so it is out of date. Um, all of your homes will have one if it was bought um, or sold within the last uh, 10 years or so. So these will give you an idea of the sorts of um, elements that make up your home. So, for example, you can see top of the uh, kind of table on the right, I've got cavity walls which are filled. Um, and it, it also gives recommendations for how you can start to improve the efficiency of your home and gives some estimated paybacks, the sort of costs for installation. Now, you do have to take those costs with a huge pinch of salt if your performance certificate was uh, calculated anything more than, well, probably even six months ago because prices have changed so significantly, um, particularly in the last six months. Um, so I would say for all of these recommendations, actually, um, probably material prices have gone up quite a bit. So things will cost a lot more. Other than the PV, actually, prices have really tumbled over the last 10 years. Um, so we bought a, a system double the size of what's recommended here for the lower um, of the price brand. So uh, that's the only thing that's kind of going to be cheaper, probably. Everything else, probably more expensive, but also the paybacks will be bigger as well, because obviously your uh, cost per kilowatt hour is much higher. Once you've understood your actual home, 
then you need to understand how you and your family use energy within your home. Again, going to be very personal to your lifestyles and circumstances. Um, and the reason you want to get to understand that um, is firstly, it can help beha drive behavioural changes. So you might want to look at things like reducing baseload, um, but also it can help you when you're making purchasing decisions. So again, these paragraphs that I've got up here, they're from my home um, somewhere back in April, just after we had our solar panels installed. And it illustrates um, kind of something that helped us make a purchasing decision when we bought our system, which is the mismatch between the solar energy being generated, which is the yellow line, and when we actually use energy, which is predominantly in the evening when the sun's not shining. So that for us helped us make the decision to buy a battery. There's many examples of how kind of understanding your energy use can help for other decisions as well, like, like buying solar hot water heating. Let's say if, if you're all over morning showers, it's not really going to hit your needs. So once you've got the understanding of your home and how you use energy with your, in your home, you need to start taking a whole house approach. So you're, you're ideally looking to be carbon neutral at what? Well, before 2050, using a fabric first approach. So looking at insulation measures to bring down that heating demand. Then looking at the efficiency of your heating and if you have it, your cooling systems. And finally, looking at self-generating uh, energy for the remainder of your energy load. A whole house approach also takes into consideration knock-on impacts that any of those measures might have on the rest of your home. So, for example, on ventilation. So, if you're thinking about insulating really well, the motto is build tight, ventilate right. Having said that you should take this kind of strategic approach of insulation first, then efficiency, then generation, Really, probably what's going to be more realistic is to look at building on your existing plans. So the two homes that I have pictured here, um, full disclosure, I'm a trustee for Cambridge Carbon Footprint, so that's why I've put some examples from Open Eco Homes. Um, so these are two examples from OEH. Um, these were done as part of a wider project that the one on the left um, it was a, a home where they were looking to extend to accommodate their growing family. Uh, the one in the middle bottom, they were looking to really heavily insulate their conservatory to make their house more livable. And they ended up incorporating a lot more energy efficiency um, and kind of green measures as part of that. But even if you're not thinking about something as grandiose as either of those, even just redecorating a room, can be an opportunity to think about energy efficiency. You might also want to think about quick wins. Uh, so maybe things like draft proofing. And the couple here are demonstrating a DIY crisp packet and toothpick draft finder. Really good way, find some drafts, cock them up. Really cheap, very DIYable. Also things like insulation, energy efficient lighting, quick and easy to do. In terms of routes forward, uh, for some of those bigger measures, you could be looking at hiring a professional, getting professional expertise on board to help you understand your home and the measures you might have installed, or you might be looking at doing things on a DIY basis. Both have their pros and cons. You might also be looking at, am I going to do everything all at once? Um, the two houses pictured, they went for everything at once. It took six months. They had to move out for a while. Um, but there are pros to that. Things like you can reuse scaffolding for the various different measures. But if you can take a phased approach, that has its benefits as well. So you can look at logically sequencing plans to fit within your budget and also the needs of your home and family. You know, if those are cho changing over the course of time. So those can take into court account the natural lifespan of things that might need replacing, so things like boilers, roofs, etc. In terms of choosing a supplier, as for recommendations locally, look for the accreditations, look for those council back schemes that um, Mel's already mentioned. And I've put some resources here so that you can get some inspiration. 
obviously OEH tours, lots of resources there. Um, they've got something which will explain how to get started with your retrofit, essentially kind of goes through what I've already been through uh, in a bit more detail and also has a bit of a kind of template plan. And West Oxfordshire have put together a really good net zero carbon toolkit and page 38 onwards talks about retrofit. Uh, the start of it talks about um, new homes, if that's of interest. And then in terms of what, what I actually do, I haven't actually talked about that yet. Um, if you are either someone who is looking for a grant and might be eligible, uh, the sort of eligibility, the criteria that apply to all of these schemes um, are things like um, an average household, sorry, not an average, a, a total household income of around £30,000 um, and an inefficient property. Um, or it might be that you're on certain benefits, um, et cetera. If you are interested in sustainable warmth, the information is available on the Decorum website. You can click through and find out more. Um, we've had some massive levels of interest, um, so do do that sooner rather than later. We're particularly keen to hear from people who are heated by off-gas properties. And that's everything from me. <laughs> Still on five minutes. Hi, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Ian Manson. Uh, I'm a volunteer. Uh, and I coordinate all the volunteering activity at Open Door in Birkenstead. It's good to be with you tonight. Uh, before going on to talking about the sustainability work that we do at Open Door, just tell you a little bit about, about Open Door. Uh, we're a charity. Uh, we're unique in Birkenstead. There isn't another uh, uh, place like us in Birkenstead, and probably not in Decorum. Uh, we're a community space that's open to all. Uh, and we provide a range of services uh, and activities, and it's all about trying to provide for those that are socially uh, uh, dealing with isolation and dealing with social inequality. Uh, I continue to be amazed by the range of services and activities that uh, Open Door provides to its community, to the Berkhamsted community. Uh, if you're interested, please go on our website. You'll see lots of different things, and there's usually something there for, for everyone. Uh, you've probably gathered I'm not from around here. Um, there's a lovely phrase at the top of this, uh, this slide. I usually challenge the English people to see if they can pronounce it, but I'll give you it. It's many mickle maximuckle. And what it basically means is lots of little things add up to a big thing. And that's, I guess, the philosophy, I think, behind energy saving, and it's the philosophy we apply at, uh, at Open Door. We do lots of little things trying to make a difference. Uh, we've been very fortunate. We've received a couple of uh, green grants from the Quorum Council uh, in the last 18 months or so. We've channeled those two grants. Uh, one has gone to our repair cafes that we run. We'll talk about them on the next slide. Uh, we have also been running a whole series of uh, activities and workshops around a make and mend program. Uh, and that really is about uh, helping people to reuse, repair, repurpose so that uh, we, we don't throw things away. So we're really teaching some of the old skills that uh, probably were there in our earlier society. Um, we've also been running a series of clothes swaps. So people bring along their clothes and they can leave them on the rail and they can choose to take other ones away. So again, it's about reusing rather than throwing away. Uh, we also, uh, in fact, tonight uh, at Open Door, there's a festive toy swap going on, uh, which is, uh, as the name suggests, it's all about exchanging toys in preparation for Christmas, helping those people that might not be able to uh, pay for uh, Christmas uh, toys. Uh, we also host the Berco Climate Cafe. Uh, we meet with us regularly. We've got a 
pottery shed that we've just reopened. So a lot of what we do is uh, a sustainable uh, focus to it. Um, this slide shows some statistics from our last repair cafe, which uh, took place in October. Uh, our next repair cafe is actually this Saturday, uh, the 5th of November, 9 o'clock to 1 o'clock in Berkhamstead on the high street. So please, please come along. Uh, some statistics from our repair cafe work. Uh, we've run 11 repair cafes since 2nd of October 2021. Uh, we deal with about 40, an average of 41 items uh, per session. And those are a mix of textiles, electrical items, ceramics, toys, uh, small appliances, wooden items, basically anything and people bring along. Um, and we've had some wonderful repair shed stories of restoring 60, 100 year old teddy bears and uh, you know, bringing them back to life. Uh, we fix 70% of uh, what is brought in which, as I understand it, is a pretty good percentage because quite a lot of appliances, wrongly, have been designed not to be repaired. Uh, so we have to deal with those. Um, so 70% is are, are fixed. Uh, in addition, we provide advice to people if, you can't, if we can't fix them. And quite often we say to people, go and get this part, bring it back, and then we'll fix it. Uh, some interesting stats we've saved 4,500 kilograms of CO2 emissions through the 11 uh, different cafes that we've run, and we've prevented 600 kilograms of landfill or 600 kilograms of stuff from going into landfill. So I think those are pretty, uh, pretty important contributions. Um, as we look forward, uh, we have our climate sustainability goals to, to try and achieve. But we have bigger, I think we've got bigger problems. Uh, we as a community space are going to have to feed our community and keep it warm. Uh, so that's going to be our big challenge this winter. I think all of you will be aware how difficult this winter is going to be for many, many people. So we've got a number of initiatives in there. Are they sustainable? Yeah, they probably are. This is, I think we're talking about sustainable communities and we should be sustaining ourselves. Uh, so we've got a community pantry, which uh, is full of food. Uh, we top it up and it gets emptied, uh, but that's uh, there. Uh, the community fills it, the community uses it. Uh, we have a community cafe, which is open to all, and we have quite a number of people who come, don't get fed anywhere else, so they come and they eat with us. That doesn't cost them anything. And later this month, we're going to launch a community fridge, and that interesting discussions earlier today with the Hemel Hempstead community fridge, and we're learning from them, and we're we're basically going to be setting up a, a food bank uh, from the end of this month. Food bank in Berkhamsted, Berkhamsted, a wealthy place, you think? No. no. Like most communities and most societies, there are challenges for a significant number of people. Keeping warm is one of our challenges as well. Uh, so you're all aware of the energy crisis uh, and we provide a warm, acceptable, welcoming space uh, for, for the community and we're going to continue to do that. We've recently just applied to be an official warm space, uh, signing up with the uh, Harts County Council and uh, we're hoping to get a little bit of grant funding from them as well uh, to continue that activity. Finishing off now simple it is our responsibility you know to help our own community and that's something we take very seriously at, at, at open door we've got to take the first step i think that's the way we tackle it thank you <laughs> Hello. 
this is the finale. I thought I might do this in a form of interpretive dance. So did yeah. you know to set with that? Yeah. Yeah. That would be, yeah. Oh. <laughs> that was quite, yeah. Um, thank you for staying to the end. It's really good. Um, and it's brilliant to be here. Thank you for inviting us today. And it's great to see all these groups and things. So let me press a thing. Oh, look. Yeah, that's me. Now, Heidi is here as well, um, but she's she's just heckling in the back there for me. So, uh, yeah. boo, she says, yeah. Um, so, there we go. A wilder future for Hearts and Middlesex. So, my name's Lee, and I'm working for Hearts and Middlesex Wildlife Trust. I'm new in post, um, started in July, along with another wilder communities officer. Basically, we're going down a new tack of putting wilder in front of everything. <laughs> that seems to be the way to go. Um, I don't come from a conservation or nature background, but I love conservation and nature. Um, and it, it's that my passion that why I'm here. But I come from a community background. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, this new initiative of Next Door Nature, Team Wilder, wilder communities and community organising. Community organising itself isn't a new thing. Many of us, many of you guys have been doing it for a very long time. Um, but the Trust is uh, realising that maybe we've not been quite as inclusive as we'd like to be. We're very much focused on often looking, scrabbling about in the mud, on seeing what kind of invertebrate or something might be there, what fish might have got up into the tree. Not necessarily looking around at the people that we want to come in and see this. As I said, I'm not an expert on the reserves. We have a number of them. They're amazing. Look at our website. Um, I'm interested in, in getting people to sort of say, oh, OK, there is this going on. But it's also going on immediately around us. So Team Wilder. Next Door Nature is about bringing communities together. And surely this is the essence of why we're here tonight. Um, we had a, a big wad of funding from the National Lottery, not lot, lot, Lottery, the National Lottery. They're closely related to the National Lottery. Um, but we've also had uh, £3,000 from Decorum Borough Council, thank you very much, um, and another five grand from Hearts Community Foundation. So we're very much focused in Hearts. My patch is Decorum. And I don't know this area very well because I'm sorry, but I come from North Hearts and Stevenage Way, so I know that area much more. But I know similar things are going on. I know we have food rescue hubs. I know we have community cafes. I know we have horticultural projects that are going on and doing amazing things with local people. And this is all going on here as well. Um, so. The next thing I'm going to say, look, I had such fun doing these little graphics. It was great. Um, so community organising, it's a different tack. In Projects are funded, people have these great ideas, and we get this team together and we say, right, we're going to come out, we're going to see you. What do you want to do? This is where we're going to do it. Come and help us. But we're kind of telling people what we want to see, you know. And, OK, that can work to a point. But, I mean, there's a really great story about uh, an Italian organisation planting tomatoes in Zambia and a herd of hippos, which I'm not going to go into right now. But it's a really good example of the fact that we need to ask people what they want in their area. That is the main thing. So it's about listening um, and supporting people to, to, to do what they want to do, because I could turn up. To, to a local area here. I don't know the situation. I don't know how, how things are for people. I know that if I start talking, they're unlikely to say, well, actually, nature is on the top of my list of things I worry about, because it probably isn't. It's going to be in there somewhere. It probably isn't about how they're going to afford an electric car either. Um, but it might be about how they're going to pay for their heating this winter. So I'm going to start that conversation and think, well, you know, something else about heating and keeping warm is getting outside and maybe doing a bit of digging in the garden. Someone else is talking about growing food in front gardens and, and um, growing our own veg. And if, if we all did a little bit of that, it would make such a massive impact. And all these people here who are mostly volunteers are doing the most incredible things 
every day and it starts with one small thing. I had a great chat earlier with a lady called Andrea. I don't know if she's still here. Hello. <laughs> and she said, you know, the brambles need cutting. So who's going to do it? She said, I am. I'm going to go and do it. I'm going to get my neighbours. And that's what we need to do. And we need to remember, and I've gone completely off script, um, that all, every trust is different and we all do it in our own way. Um, it's community first. We need to go out there. I need to go out there. I would like you to come and talk to me. I did have a, a list out there for people to sign up, but all this will get shared, my information. Get in touch. Let me know what you're already doing. There's no point in me trying to come and reinvent the wheel because you've already had all these brilliant ideas. But we each bring in a different perspective. We each can go and, and try new things. And um, again, someone else is saying we're approaching different organisations, whether it be wilder schools, wilder communities, wilder businesses. And we're not taking no for an answer because there's no reason to be faced with flat no's. It's called well, why? Because we need to make things work and it's possible. And this is about acknowledging that as individuals and as communities, we do have power. We very much faced a lot of the time with being told what we can and can't do, constant limitations being put on things, funding cut all over the place. This doesn't have to be about money. It really doesn't. This is about what we can all do together to make things change. There we go. Look, you lead. We change things. We organise. We listen. We support and we enable. And we say we, we're going to turn up with bags of enthusiasm and just say, yes, we can do this. Now, I'm not being naive here. I've been sort of in community work a very long time. Um, and sometimes I can get very cynical and pessimistic, you know, and sometimes I want to go in the dark room and cry. And that's all right. I need to get that off me, off my chest, you know, and then get back up and get out there again. And right, well, I'm going to keep on trying because one small action, one small conversation is like that little pebble in the pond. And it has this ripple effect that can make such massive changes. And we can do that. Every single one of us in here can make a real difference. Right, um, yeah, so gardens and urban spaces, I'll be happy to talk to people about transforming their balcony, putting a, 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 a trug, that's a good word, isn't it? Those plastic things with put, put, um, soil in that. Um, grow potatoes, just grow enough for you. If there's a glut, you share it with the community. I, I changed my front garden in lockdown to veggies, you know, which is you know, varying results, but it, it's certainly a talking point. Um, just little things that we can all do. So whilst it's lovely to have you all coming out to our amazingly beautiful, stunning reserves, you can also do things on your own patch. So this is where next door nature comes in. Yeah, there was a big report. Yeah, lots of depressing things on it. If you want to have a look at that sometime, we can give you the link to that. Things ain't good. But what's already been going on, Heidi, my amazing colleague over there, has already been wilding in St Albans. She's just every day wilding. Um, and she's <laughs> but not on her own. She's had people working with her and people coming forward. And we've got schools, we've got gardens and they're, and they're growing veg and they've got these amazing water things going. So the stuff's getting watered and without the rain because we didn't have any. And we're sharing ideas and people could have got different experiences and different suggestions. Lots of schools have been working with the college, churches, all those sorts of things. So that's already been happening in St Albans. And you can see all that kind of stuff on our website and look up Next Door Nature. But what can we do with decorum? How are we going to wild that? Is there somewhere where you live where there's a, a, a disused space or something that's looking a little bit I don't know, tatty. I mean, it's all in the eye of the beholder, isn't it, really? Um, can we plant some things there? Can we um, grow some random tomatoes? There's no chance of any hippos, at least in decorum, to come and eat them all. Um, the edges are playgrounds, borders. So, you know, I'm open to suggestions because I want to hear about what you want where you live. So please spread the word. Please do get in touch. 
Oh, look, I skipped one, and that's okay. So it's kind of coming to a, a, a I've got a, a quick little film, which I, can, I will, I yeah, um, which kind of sums up what I'm trying to get across in this very slightly nervously clumsy way. <laughs> Oh, um, but please do get in touch with us. Um, the details will be shared afterwards, and I'd love to hear from you. I love to catch up with existing groups and hear about all your wonderful stuff as well. Thank you very much. Let's just listen to George the poet. <laughs> it was and we kept saying no Jordan don't worry there won't be any issues at the end don't worry so this is all good That's why I can be quiet. Uh, all right, sorry, I've meant to get that sooner, but the video threw me off. So let me take a quick look at your questions. Thank you for sending them through again. Um, so let me take a look. Um, we have a question for Open Door. Um, would you mind uh, coming up to my phone so that people at home can hear? Have you had an increase of people repairing items due to the cost of living crisis? Uh, I think the cost of living crisis has probably hit quite a number of people who deal with Open Door, who come to Open Door, and we probably see it in a number of different ways. And yes, I, I would imagine people coming to the repair cafe, uh, you know, it's, it's, that could be one of the drivers. We probably see it most often, though, in, in the people that come to make use of our cafe, come to eat with us, come to use our pantry. Um, so that's probably where we're seeing the cost of living crisis really hitting. Um, I don't want to be a doomsayer, but I think we're expecting it to get worse over the winter. Thank you very much. Uh, we have two questions for the Energy Hub. Um, so but I know you said before, nothing technical. <laughs> so um, what top tip could you provide to reduce energy use in my home? Is that a question from somebody here? Because I'm just wondering whether that's a behavioural or a technological. Oh, that's true. <laughs> I would say behavioural is a big one, which our app is great for. Um, LED light bulbs, uh, turn things off. Um, but really, that's it. Behavior, I think, in a nutshell, is answering the question. 
Yeah, I mean, look at your, your look at your behaviour as a first port of call. If you were after a technological kind of, what should I do to my home first? I would say insulate. Um, your loft is going to be cheaper uh, to do. Your cavity walls are going to be reasonable to do. So, so look at an insulation for a first port of call to really reduce um, the heating demands as a first port of call is is what I would say. And the draft as well, actually. Use, use your little homemade uh, crisp pack and toothpick and find those drafts and just cock those up. Can you really quick and easy. Not, this is my own question. What yeah. is this crisp, crisp packet and toothpick? I don't understand what this is. Well, all they did, <laughs> all they did the, 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 the couple that are on there, they've done a phased approach and a really DIY and they, they've done lots of really neat little kind of hacks and tips and interesting ways of doing things. Um, they're both quite reasonably expertise that the chap actually works on over the eco home so you know he, that's the sort of level they're at and his, his partner Anne is also um, an engineer I believe um, so all she did was got a crisp packet cut a flag out of it so just a long triangle shape stuck it to the toothpick and then she went around her home just and, and the reason Tom looked silly in that picture is because he was just really gently blowing to show how sensitive that crisp packet was to kind of any little drafts. And then you can just go around with a bit of pulp or whatever and just seal up those drafts. Right. Cheap and easy. I'm going to say as well, um, because we just to reiterate, we do have the Green Community Grant funding applications open. Um, I would love to see a thermal camera scheme, uh, loan scheme in, in the borough. So if anyone's interested in that, um, put in an application. <laughs> um, and Yes, yes. I've been in touch with, yes. Uh, <laughs> so if you want to expand that, then um, yeah, send me an email. Um, and another question, which it would be quite a brief one, I think. Uh, can you put solar panels on a roof that has a loft conversion? Do you know? If you don't know, that's, that's fine. Uh, so it, in terms of loft conversion, it, it would I suppose it would depend which side, if you're looking at the loft conversion. There's a significant uh, decrease in solar panel out output if it's shaded. So the issue is if you've got a loft conversion and it's on your south facing or whatever your optimum kind of roof face is, um, then that could significantly affect the performance of the solar panels. Um, but I have shading issues as well, not from the loft conversion, but because I live right next to some woods. Um, so just having those trees there has cut down the performance of my panels by about 10 percent. Um, but that was still worthwhile to kind of go ahead with. So if you do have that, what, what I would say is just go ahead and get a quote. There's a sort of there's templates sort of ways of calculating things. Uh, so they should be able to kind of take your specific circumstances and run your exact circumstances. You know, how big is your roof? What exact orientation it is it how big is it so how many panels can you get on it what's the likely shading and, and get kind of churn out a number for you so you'll have an idea well what's the upfront cost and they'll usually tell that tell you the payback as well i will just add a hint of caution i, I had several different quotes not all of them factored in the shading even though i mentioned it <laughs> so <laughs> just take take their calculations and interrogate them a bit yeah. is what I would say. Yeah, three quotes is always a good rule, rule of thumb. Yeah. Um, there's a general one here from DBC, which I'll answer uh, quickly as well. Uh, so the question is, why net zero in 2050? Isn't that far too late and too far away to promote behaviour change now uh, by government, industry or individuals? Um, so obviously we are in a climate and ecological emergencies. We are meant to be acting quickly. So that's, I think, a, a very valid question with the date of 2050. So just to explain that. Um, 2050 is the date currently set by our government. Um, uh, as Claire mentioned earlier, uh, we have COP27 happening next week, where hopefully we might see more targets. So potentially for the government, that date may change, but we are very much stuck with, um, because the government will be the ones chiefly providing the funding for us to be able to retrofit homes and, um, uh, like the government funding that we've applied for for the EV charging um, points and things like that. So um, that wider aspect will be a big part of it. However, I will caveat that very heavily with we absolutely need urgent change. Um, and the IPCC reports that I mentioned earlier, um, the, the world's leading scientists on climate um, 
do say that we have to peak emissions by 2025 and halve them again by 2030. Um, so when we're saying net zero in 2050, that isn't saying carry on as normal until 2048 and then let's think about it. That's we absolutely all need to act right now. Um, and I'll come back to that strategy because it's been my life for a year. <laughs> but please look at it. And there's a really good curve for it. That Tyndall curve shows that we need to be dropping emissions immediately. So it isn't that linear thing. It is it is cutting down straight away. So realistically for the borough, we should be looking to halve our emissions in the next five years. Um, so please don't feel that when you see the figure 2050, that don't be disheartened that action isn't happening now because it absolutely is. Um, and anything we can do to keep this momentum going is really important. So that, that's why having everyone here today is, is really important to kind of help achieve those emission reductions even further. And of course, increasing biodiversity as well. Got probably time for one last question because we have overrun horrifically. I'm so sorry, everyone, that the <laughs> timing went a bit off today. Um, so this one's for the Hearts and Essex Wildlife Trust. If you want to come to the mic. Um, well, there's two, there's two ones, but I'll merge them um, so you can watch them at the same time. So what are the first steps in rewilding my garden? And do you do anything to help schools with rewilding projects? So gardens and schools. Right. What are the first steps in rewilding? Well, give me a shout, basically. Get in touch. <laughs> Um, there's a lot of resources already on the on the website as well, um, and it depends on where the garden is and all those sort of aspects and that. But um, get in touch is the first step. Yes, I'd say that. And then schools. Um, so when you say get in touch, is that the Royal Trust website is best? Yeah, uh, things going on. Uh, absolutely. The, our local website. Get in touch with me directly, and um, I can field it out if necessary. But. Um, that's good, you know, rewilding a garden is a really good thing to do in terms of our sort of on the doorstep nature. So please send me an email. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, what was the other question? Uh, just with schools as well, which I imagine. Schools. Um, yes, there, there is a lot of stuff going on in schools that I described what Heidi's already been doing with St Albans schools. That we have a, a wilder schools network. We had a, a, a quarterly meetings as one just the other day where different schools invite us round to see what they're doing. Um, but we're very much open to hear from more schools who want to do something on their grounds, whether it be a small truck, I like that word, or whether they want to get trees. Now's the time of planting trees. So if you want to get on that Woodland Trust, giving away free trees, but you need to do that now. Um, but there's just lots of possibilities. So just please start the conversation with me, with us, and we can take it from there. Yeah, thank okay. you so much. Okay, we've reached the end of the event. Um, so uh, to conclude our current speaker section, thank you so much again to all of our wonderful speakers. Uh, so final last messages, um, if you haven't already, please do join the Decorum Climate Action Network. Uh, we have links on the event flyers, which if you didn't pick one up on the way in, then on the way out, there's there's a, a link on there. Um, and thank you very much to all those who have joined, um, which I think is probably most of you, because that's how all the tickets got sold. So thank you. Um, Please also remember all of the activities downstairs. So we've got the, the free wildflower seed packets. Uh, we have um, some free sustainable clothes, which were left over from last weekend's swap. So you can see an example of what's been brought along. But they're free if you like something or know someone that would like it, please help yourself. Um, shout out to the dress came from a clothes swap. Love clothes swaps. <laughs> so I've done an open door for <laughs> doing more of these as well. Um, and uh, if you haven't already, if you could please return any cups that you brought upstairs to the used cup table downstairs. Um, Please continue to enjoy networking in the five minutes available left. <laughs> uh, we do have to be out the building by nine. Um, so, uh, <laughs> um, as I said, we, we've accented everyone a little bit, but um, I don't. Our facilities management have been absolutely brilliant today, so I, I don't want to upset them. Um, if you took any photos of the event, we'd love to see them. Please email them to us. If you could re please return your name badges to the table that you found them so we can reuse them, that'd be wonderful. Um, and we are going to send an email next week to all of the attendees uh, with the slides, links and photos of the event. Uh, so a final thank you. And I know Claire is going to come in after me. Um, but just thank you to everyone who's come along tonight, all of the stallholders, uh, the people who watched online. Thank you so much if you're still with us, um, all of the speakers um, and the staff involved. So Kelly, Claudia, Joe and Jordan, thank you so much. 
Um, and everyone, again, that's joined the Decorum Climate Action Network uh, as an individual and organisation. Thank you so much. The one person Mel didn't mention was herself, and I just want to acknowledge all the work that Mel puts into not only supporting our climate change work, our sustainability agenda, but the networking that she's creating in the borough. Um, and I think we could have all the policies and strategies in the world, but without people like Mel bringing them to life and re really delivering action and change, we wouldn't be where we are now. So a really big thank you to Mel for the work that she does. Thanks, Mel. Safe journey home, thank you.